You would not be watching this video if you did not dream of exploring distant worlds. And one of us can be the first human to drive down into Valles Marineris or climb to the blue sand dunes of Bagnold near Mount Sharp. To cover more ground we will need to choose a safe dependable means of ground transportation. A rover. To make sure you know how these work and what the options are, let's look at the technology of off-world rovers. Several companies have built very dependable rover systems for off-world exploration, and newer companies have Earth vehicles that might be easily modified for off-world use. Many companies have recognized the potential market for these rovers. Elon Musk has already said that a pressurized version of Cybertruck will be used on Mars and presumably the Moon, while Toyota has been designing this rover, which the Japanese space agency JAXA plans to use on the Moon. And then there's this one by the European Space Agency. All of these vehicles will use the knowledge gained by the Apollo rovers, Lunacod, and modern systems to help develop robust, dependable means of transportation so we can safely explore the Moon and Mars and start building off-world colonies so that our children can have a better future. Exploring the solar system will require rovers and RVs capable of all-terrain travel that will not leave you stranded. An off-world rover has already been built and tested on the moon. The lunar rovering vehicle was built by Boeing, back when the engineers were in charge and they were an amazing company, dedicated to humanity's survival in space. The lunar roving vehicle was a battery-powered vehicle used on the last three Apollo missions to the moon. These rovers had a mass of only 210 kilograms and could carry up to 490 kilograms of explorers, equipment, and samples. It was supposed to have a top speed of 13 kilometers per hour, but when you put a test pilot behind the wheel of anything, you will quickly find out what its real limits are, and on Apollo 17 they were able to get it up to 18 kilometers per hour. Thank you Eugene Cernan for setting the lunar land speed record, which I hope someone listening to this lesson will break someday. This may not sound that fast, but when you consider that the average walking speed of a human is at best half that, and you're burning a lot of oxygen traveling on the moon and having to do so much more carefully than on Earth. These rovers folded up and were carried in the Quadrant 1 bay of the lunar module. During all three missions, they traveled an average of 30 kilometers and were of course left on the moon. The first selfie near one of these will probably get you in serious trouble with the NASA historians. So electric vehicle technology was good enough in the early 1970s to safely drive on the moon. Makes you wonder what took so long for us to have electric cars on the roads of Earth. Let's look at the specifications of this vehicle. The concept of a lunar roving vehicle was proposed by Werner von Braun in 1952 and published in Collier's Weekly. The February 1964 issue of Popular Science also had an article by von Braun on the need for a lunar rover. Professor Mikislaw Becker wrote two books on the subject that helped guide NASA's decisions. Studies began at the Marshall Space Flight Center with contributions from Lockheed, Bendix, Boeing, General Motors, Brown Engineering, Grumman, and Bell Aerospace. And then they were finally built by Boeing and General Motors. It was originally assumed that two Saturn Vs would have to be used, one for the crew and one for a large heavy lunar surface module truck. These were pressurized vehicles designed by Grumman and Northrop in 1962 and had electric motors on each wheel. Bendix and Boeing started their own designs while General Motors hired Professor Becker to work on his design with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Professor Becker designed a small uncrewed lunar roving vehicle for the surveyor program using wire mesh wheels designed by Ferenc Pavlich from Hungary. NASA wrote a 10 volume study on these designs and settled on a pressurized vehicle with a mass of up to 3,840 kilograms that could carry all supplies and accommodate two explorers for up to two weeks. The original contracts went to Bendix and Boeing with Bell Aerospace working on lunar flying vehicles, but Marshall was keeping its options open by also looking at small fixed habitats with an open lunar rover that could be operated by one person or controlled remotely. Several full-scale test vehicles were built and considered. 
As the U.S. Congress started to reduce Apollo funding, it was necessary to avoid two launches per mission and find another way. It was decided that any rover would have to be carried on the same Saturn V as the crew. There would be no mobile laboratory or pressurized vehicle. It was decided that a compact two-person rover would be designed and built. The Brown Engineering Company in Huntsville, Alabama had been helping with the previous design work and Von Brown bypassed the usual process and had Brown start immediately on a smaller design. Brown Engineering used the earlier work and commercially available components to quickly put together a test rover. They chose the wire mesh tires designed by Mr. Pavlich. The test vehicle was built and tested on a track simulating lunar regolith with craters and debris. This vehicle could be operated remotely or crewed by two people. The vehicle was even tested for bounce height in 1-6 gravity in a KC-135A aircraft flying in an arc, providing partial freefall. In May 1969, NASA approved the Manned Lunar Rover Vehicle Program managed by Sonny Moria. Wheels, motors, and suspension were made by General Motors, while Boeing provided the chassis, navigation system, and electronics. Four lunar rovers were built at a cost of $38 million. These rovers were flown on the last three Apollo missions and greatly expanded the range of exploration. Now focus on that for a minute. In 17 months, these companies built four functional lunar rovers, none of which malfunctioned, for $38 million, which today would probably be around $400 million. But imagine what a modern company would charge NASA to produce this same type of vehicle. Now the wheels used on the moon had a spun aluminum hub and an 81 centimeter diameter, 23 centimeter wide tire made of zinc coated woven 0.84 millimeter diameter steel strands attached to the rims. The braking discs were formed aluminum. 50% of the wheel contact area had titanium chevrons to provide traction. Inside the tire was a 65 centimeter diameter bump stop frame to protect the hub and fenders to protect from thrown dust were mounted above the wheels. Each wheel had its own direct current series wound electric motor capable of 0.25 horsepower or 190 watts at 10,000 RPM and made by Delco. These were attached to the wheel via an 80 to 1 harmonic drive and with the mechanical brake unit. Each wheel could be released to freewheel in case of drive failure. There were a few minor problems. The Apollo 16 crew lost a rear fender, allowing dust to cover the vehicle and crew during operation and overheating the batteries, though they continued to function just fine. Another fender was lost by Apollo 17, and while Eugene Cernan tried to duct tape it back on, it was lost, and dust again covered the rover and crew. In true American fashion, they made a new fender out of maps, duct tape, and clamps. The rovers also had a remote control color camera that NASA could use from Earth while the astronauts were focusing on driving and exploring. This is how we have footage of the Apollo Lunar Ascent Vehicle blasting off the surface where you can see the camera pan and follow the vehicle. They had tried to do this on Apollo 15 and 16, but the timing was off due to the transmission delay. They were successful on Apollo 17. These rovers were vital to the geological discoveries made by these last three missions that have given us a better understanding of the evolution of the moon. The Soviets had their own lunar rover design, despite the cancellation of their manned landing attempts. They went with a remotely controlled, uncrewed rover called Lunacod. Lunacod means moonwalker, which is a pretty cool name. The Lunacod rovers were designed and built by Alexander Kamurzian and his team at the Lavochkin Research and Production Association headquartered in Moscow. The Soviets had planned to land these at exploration sites on the moon prior to sending crewed missions to examine the landing area and have them act as radio beacons. The Soviets had also started planning for a permanent lunar base called Zvezda. This base would eventually have nine modules, 8.6 by 3.3 meters, landed individually and massing 18 tons each. They were expandable to 4.5 meters diameter by inflation. They would contain living, dining, laboratory, life support, and medical areas for 9 to 12 cosmonauts. A layer of protective regolith would be deposited over the modules for radiation and micrometeorite protection. There were also mobile modules designed to build a lunar train for exploration which would have eight wheels with separate drives on each one. 
These would have a crew of four cosmonauts and contain modules for living space, drilling operations, and energy and life support. The lunar regolith would have been mined and processed for water and other useful materials. When all this was sadly canceled as the Soviets gave up after the failure of their L-1 rocket, they decided to use the Lunokhod rovers themselves to explore the moon. The Lunokhods would be sent to the moon on lunar spacecraft launched by a Proton-K rocket. Lunokhod 1A was destroyed on launch when the rocket failed, but Lunokhod 1 was carried safely by the Luna 17 spacecraft to its landing site at Mare Imbrium, which means the Sea of Rains, on November 17, 1970 at 0347 UTC. It was the first wheeled vehicle to land on any extraterrestrial body. It had been designed to last at least three lunar days, which would be about 90 Earth days, and survived 321 Earth days, exploring a distance of 10.54 kilometers. You can see its path here. The Lunokhod had a large convex lid that protected the interior and lifted up to reveal solar panels on the inside. It had eight wheels independently powered by electric motors and pressurized containers. Each motor had two forward and two reverse speeds with a top speed of 100 meters per hour. It was 2.3 meters in length, 1.35 meters tall, and had a mass of 756 kilograms. It had four television cameras, an X-ray spectrometer, an X-ray telescope, cosmic ray detectors, laser reflecting mirrors, and regolith testing extensions. The Lunokhod was powered by batteries producing 180 watts, and used solar energy cells to recharge. It was remotely driven by a five-person team on Earth. Remember the lunar day or day loon, as I prefer, is a little more than two Earth weeks long. The rover used a special fluoride-based lubricant to allow it to operate in the extreme cold and heat of the lunar surface. A dark loon or lunar night is also two weeks, and the extreme cold is deadly to batteries. The Lunokhod protected itself with a nuclear-powered heater using polonium-210. The landing vehicle had dual ramps for the Lunokhod to choose from. A little more than three hours after landing, the Lunokhod rolled down one of the ramps to start exploring. During its mission, it sent back 20,000 television images with 206 panoramas. It performed 25 soil sample analyses and tested the regolith's mechanical properties at over 500 locations. It had laser reflectors that were used by the Soviet Union and France to measure the distance from the Earth to the Moon down to an accuracy of 30 centimeters. Lunokhod 1 was the first remote-controlled robot to land on any extraterrestrial body. In 1973, Lunokhod 2 was launched. The Luna 21 spacecraft landed on 15 January 1973 and deployed the Lunokhod 2 at Lemonnier Crater at 25.85 degrees north, 30.45 degrees east. Lunokhod 2 traveled three times further than Lunokhod 1, and you can see its path here. It is estimated to have traveled 39 kilometers. This was the record for any off-world rover until it was beaten by the Opportunity rover on Mars, which traveled 40 kilometers. Interestingly, after operating for four months and being shut down, the Lunokhod 2 was auctioned in December of 1993 at Sotheby's in New York to the son of astronaut Owen K. Garriott a computer gaming entrepreneur and space tourist named Richard Garriott. Mr. Garriott stated in a 2001 interview that he had purchased the Lunokhod from the Russians and was now the world's only private owner of an object on a foreign celestial body. Though there are international treaties that say no government shall lay claim to geography off planet Earth, he said he was not a government. He then claimed ownership of the moon in the name of Lord British, his gaming identity, I presume. That being said, while it is legal to own a human manufactured object on the moon, you cannot, according to the Outer Space Treaty, own the moon itself. If you built a mining operation on the moon, you would own the base structure itself and control the area immediately around it and encompassed by it. You would own the processed materials that you mined according to the Artemis Accords that has been developed by the United States and accepted by Australia, Canada, Japan, Luxembourg, Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United Arab Emirates on October 13, 2020, with Ukraine becoming the ninth signatory on November 13, 2020. What can we learn from these rovers to apply to the new ones we will need on the Moon and Mars in the future? The Moon is easy. You will always know when solar energy will be available on the Moon, and will have to plan for dark lunar operations. The easiest solution would be to add a hydrogen fuel cell. 
you don't know how these work, see our lesson on this technology here. The hydrogen and oxygen needed will be provided by breaking down water that has been mined from the lunar craters or soil. The hydrogen fuel cells can be of the efficient PME type and could operate at a low level to maintain the rover's temperature when in shadow or not being used. There is a lot of speculation that Tesla automobiles are dual purpose and its modification could make them ideal for off-world rovers. On Mars, I would recommend a different type of fuel cell. The carbonate fuel cell operates at a higher temperature that allows it to use methane for fuel without carbon poisoning. Many fuel cells must avoid any carbon dioxide or methane as carbon contamination in the process will destroy the fuel cell. Molten carbonate fuel cells can use liquid methane with no problem. And since it is much easier to work with than liquid hydrogen and has to be produced for rocket operations, it would be an ideal choice. And a little extra heat on Mars is not a bad idea. It gets chilly there. There are also new types of fuel cells that use methane without such high temperatures. The Georgia Institute of Technology has developed a solid state fuel cell with a stack about the size of an average shoebox. It can operate at 500 centigrade, which sounds hot, but is below the 600 centigrades of an internal combustion engine, and a lot lower than the 750 to 1000 centigrade that most methane fuel cells have to operate at. This new device, developed by professors Liu, De Glee, and Yu, uses a catalyst made of cerium, nickel, and ruthenium, and abbreviated CNR. You will note that these are rare earth elements, and another reason why mining the moon for elements rare on earth but abundant in meteors is so important. Don't forget that at the center of every crater was a meteor. Some of these will be metallic with a high platinum group content. Now make sure you are up to date on fuel cell technology as it will be a vital component of the new space industry. You will notice that I have ignored many of the Mars rovers like Spirit and Opportunity. These rovers teach us a lot about Mars and about operating mechanical equipment in extreme conditions. But these were solar powered and terribly slow on Mars due to the limited solar energy at that distance from the sun. Solar won't work well for human travel on Mars unless you have a lot of time. Methane fuel cell rovers are a much better choice. You can use large solar farms back at the base. Solar is still viable for the moon. These rovers will be much faster and more robust than those used by the Apollo astronauts. But with what we learned from Apollo and Lunacon, we should have autonomous regolith processing exploration vehicles operating on the moon in the near future. The smartest next step would be to land uncrewed large rovers on the moon with onboard laboratories and a pressurized compartment to start testing this technology before we put humans there. We should also have semi-autonomous regolith processing rovers 3D printing titanium aluminum plates and collecting volatiles like oxygen, methane, nitrogen, water, and helium-3 and 4 for research and future use. It can 3D print containers, fill them with these valuable materials, and deposit them for future collection. Then crude versions for exploration, research, and resource utilization. It is very sad that nuclear-powered rovers have been sent to Mars for the last several decades, but not to the moon for over 50 years. There is no excuse for this. We could directly remote control a rover from Earth, and there is no reason why we haven't accomplished this. If the European Space Agency or Japan are serious about being a player in space exploration, this would be a good way to get started. China is fast on their way to developing this technology and should soon have large rovers just like I described operating on the moon. Having a large capable rover mapping precious metal and water deposits would be the fastest way to make your place on the new frontier. In fact, if you were to 3D print a ring around the area, it might stake your claim to that resource since no one could enter your compound without permission. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. At Astra Proterra, stay safe.